welcome all of you to the presentation uh, to this presentation where we're discussing the findings and recommendations from the independent evaluation of the relevance and effectiveness of GCF investments in the small island developing states, the SIDS. This is from the Independent Evaluation Unit, the IEU of the GCF. My name is Archie Rastogi. I'm an evaluation specialist here at the IEU. I'm joined by my colleague, Andres Raymond, who's, uh, who's a principal evaluation officer, and both of us were co task managers for this evaluation, which is now concluding. We, uh, here in Songdo at the IEU, we were also, uh, our team included uh, Ms. David Huang, Ms. Nana Kim, and Greg Clough. Uh, who provided expertise in various, various domains on this evaluation. Externally, we were also supported by a group of experts. Jessica Kyle, uh, who's with the ICF, also uh, uh, the team included Howard Murado, Vasantha Chase, and Peter Weston, who are in different parts of the world and provided different sets of expertise to this evaluation. And all of us co-wrote, co-owned this evaluation report. Externally as well, uh, we had an advisory panel, which, which included Dr. Geeta Batra. She's the chief evaluation officer and deputy director at the independent evaluation office of the Global Environment Facility. Ms. Miva Kato, who's a program officer at the UNFCCC. Dr. Alexandre Manian, who's a senior research fellow at the IDRI and the Sciences Po. And, uh, uh, and Ms. Fikita, uh, Fikita Moela Katao Taikamano. She's the High Representative and the Under Secretary General for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States at the UN. So uh, we had a very eminent advisory panel who engage, who, whose expertise we were able to draw upon at various points in this evaluation. And let's get started very quickly. How do we, how, what's our understanding of the SIDS as we went into this evaluation? So in our understanding, we looked at SIDS as SIDS that spread across the world, but, but constituted very loosely in three geographic groups. The first being the Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, and South China Sea. The second group uh, if constituted by uh, countries in the Pacific region, and the third in the Caribbean region. What we do know about them is that they share very little among themselves. So SIDS is a political category, a political distinction, and they share very little in common across all the 40 GCF eligible countries. And uh, very little in common in terms of their economic status, political status, history, and geography as well. What many of them do share is that most of them are highly vulnerable to climate change impacts. And that's something that's quite common across all SIDS. Taking into account this high vulnerability, the UNFCCC, the COP, the governing instrument of the GCF, as well as the board of the GCF have noted and, uh, uh, and uh, identified the mandate that this institution, the GCF has towards particularly vulnerable groups, including the SIDS, the least developed countries and Africa. And in response to that mandate, the IU is undertaking this concerted effort. And this evaluation is part of that effort to look at the relevance and effectiveness of the GCF in different sets of those vulnerable countries. When we started this evaluation, we, the, one of the first things we looked at was to review the literature, do a benchmarking across organizations, comparable, uh, comparable organizations, and interview experts. And one of the th things we found was a set of normative values which we found uh, to be the set of values that any institution such as the GCF that makes investments in countries such as the SIDS should uh, seek after, should seek to, uh, to comply with. And what are these values? We found five important ones. The first one is flexibility. So the context of the countries changes with, can change within a country quite drastically as well as across countries. And this context can also change across times. So uh, a lot of flexibility is important in designing climate interventions in the SIDS. The second thing we found of value was to be was, was capacity. A lot of the SIDS are low in human resource as well as other dimensions of capacity. And this needs to be accounted for in design of climate interventions in the SIDS. The third we found to be important was urgency, a sense of urgency, because the impacts of climate are quite, are very, very urgent now, and any climate intervention needs to happen now, right now. Fourthly, we found that high transaction costs were quite common across the SIDS. Uh, it, it, it is quite expensive compared to other countries to, to undertake operations in many of the SIDS, and this needs to be accounted for as well. 
And lastly, we found that the distinction between adaptation and development is quite artificial, especially in the SIT, where one dimension cannot be distinguished necessarily. There's no neat distinction between what constitutes adaptation and what constitutes development project. And in the, in the following chapters, you will see that we've made a special note of these normative values. For the sake of clarity, these values are cro quite cross-cutting. Just for the sake of clarity uh, and communication, we will address one value in, in one chapter or one area that we look at for the rest of the presentation. So firstly, we look at, it's coming to the key findings, we look at the policies and the, the, uh, the incorporation of flexibility in the GCF policies. What did we find there? We found that in response to the COP guidance, and, and many of which is SID specific, the GCF board, as well as the secretariat, have undertaken special action uh, with mixed results for SIDS. So for instance, many policy frameworks and, uh, and programs started by the GCF do take into account the special needs. For instance, the accreditation framework, the readiness program, inputs into the strategic plan, the last one, as well as the one that's under discussion right now and the simplified approval process. They all, to certain degrees, take into account the needs of urgency, the needs of capacity building, et cetera. Their implementation, however, will be important and uh, limited evidence is available on the implementation of some of, these, some of these programs, as well as the changes they've undergone uh, very recently. What's not so explicitly accounted for so far is flexibility. And in terms of flexibility, a lot of the policies are yet to be adopted or implemented. For instance, the policy on concessionality, programmatic approaches, incremental costs, restructuring. All of these policies are very important to the contexts of the SIDS and, will, and do have the promise of providing flexibility that the SIDS need and their implementation will be important. Separately from this, we also found that the discussion of loss and damage which is very crucial to the context of this season one that since it's been championing has not yet concluded and will remain important for the sits uh, as the GCF is, uh, is now party to that discussion. Now we look at access and the, the, uh, the, and how whether access accounts for the need of capacity building in the sits. The GCF business model, as we know, is, uh, is based on accreditation. And accreditation occupies a central part in the business model of the GCF, but this business model then disadvantages the SIDS in some, in some ways. Firstly, accreditation to the GCF, which is a means to get access to resources, takes too long. It's more than 450 days to go from submission of application to approval by the board for accreditation. This is, mind you, this is not as long as it takes other entities to get accredited. It takes them even longer, but this is still too long. More worryingly, uh, only four countries in the SIDS have national entities now accredited already. So that's only four out of 40, that's 10%. And on the left of your screen, you'll see a table which, which identifies that currently only 10% of the SIDS have national entities. Even if all of the entities in the pipeline were to get now accredited today, only 18% of the SIDS will have national entities. But uh, that means that uh, many of the SIDS rely on regional entities for GCF pipelines, which is good. But we also find that the regional entities then face their own challenges. So very often a regional entity uh, caters to a dozen or more countries and has limited staff. So many regional entities that we interviewed found themselves to be overwhelmed with, request, with requests from member countries. Very often also national entities tend to have very limited capacity in terms of human resources. Most of the entities we spoke to and we interviewed had between one to four full-time staff looking at GCF projects. So many of them had full-time staff looking at GCF projects. Uh, the number of full-time staff was less than the number of speakers of this panel. And uh, that we found to be quite a huge challenge in access to the, uh, to the GCF resources. Many international entities do not find that they have enough incentives to undertake projects, GCF projects in, the, in this sense. And that remains a challenge as well. Accreditation in and, in and of itself does not necessarily build capacities of entities to undertake projects. While it is a test of their compliance with GCF standards, it does not build as a process the capacities of entities. We're also finding that readiness does not systematically and necessarily conclusively bridge the gap between accreditation and the ability of an entity 
to propose projects to the GCF. Thank you, Archie. Um, so once again, my name is Andreas, and I will uh, now uh, drive, through, drive you through the remainder of uh, the slides. And uh, here we come. In this section, we are discussing on how the GCF processes, programs, and modalities have taken into account the specific needs that we spoke about, the specific needs of the SITs and the urgency of climate action in the SITs. So I, I bring to you here uh, a slide with two aspects to look at. On the right-hand side, you see the key characteristics of the GCF SITS portfolio. And that is all in also uh, put out in relation to the entire GCF portfolio to give you a better, a better overview. On the left-hand side, and this uh, is now the, the, the focus for this, for this slide and for, for my presentation here, I'll, uh, I show you the, the main findings, the main takeaways and features of the SITS portfolio in more, in more clarity and more depth. So uh, right to it, we would say, what works for us here at the GCF? Relatively speaking, the SITS addresses more adaptation intervention. That's about 60% of all the entire SITS portfolio is an adaptation compared to, uh, to the non-SITS. Secondly, while on project basis, the SITS receive proportionally fewer resources, per capita basis, the SITS, uh, however, receive substantially more finance. And we believe that's, that's adequate and that's good. And thirdly, uh, when looking at the question of how quickly are projects approved, so how quickly the project development process is, is completed and then brought forward to the, uh, to the board, we found that this process is on average faster in the SIDS compared to the non-SIDS. And here in specific terms, it's around about 70 days faster for small and medium-sized projects. Next slide. In the next slide, you see a, a graphical description of what I've just said. So if you look on the top bar, which represents the SIDS investments, you find that of all investments, according to the result areas that are, that are given to the different projects, 49% directly relate to adaptation, and 13% are adaptation cross-cutting uh, uh, activities. So on total, 62% of all investments in the SITs are on adaptation. The lower bar shows you the comparator of all non-SITs, so the remainder of the GCF portfolio. And here you look at 36%. Uh, next slide. Um, but there is also the turn side of this story, and that is to say what's currently not working. And here we looked at the question of modalities and, and, and funding windows. So we found that the general uh, project approval process, as well as the SAP, the perception is that these processes are still too lengthy and not responding to the urgency in the SIDS. In addition to this, the RFPs, which are requests for proposals that are put out uh, by the GCF, are not fully utilized in the SIDS and therefore do not help to bring about more innovative and replicable approaches. Secondly, we also ask ourselves the questions, how does that relate to the pipeline of projects that we have? And when we looked at the pipeline of funding proposals, so that's that stage after a possible concept node approval, concept node approval, we found that the SIDs are proportionally underrepresented. In fact, only 12% of the pipeline of funding proposals relate to the SIDs, and that's a worry. When then thinking about possible reasons for such an underrepresentation, we found in interviews with, uh, with an array of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of uh, consulted uh, stakeholders in the countries as well as in the Secretariat, that most often it's the capacity to develop concept nodes. That's the big, that's the greatest challenge to build a pipeline. And in addition to these, to these challenges, we also thought about prominent barriers to provide funding proposals. And here we found that most often access to data presents the biggest barrier to bring forward successful funding proposals. And there are three comments that to be made on the access to data. First of all, when we look at the question of data, we find that the, 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 the guidance that's currently giving 
uh, given and the definitions that, that are currently being drafted on climate rationale are still not informing the stakeholders to exactly identify the climate rationale for, for, for the different projects in the SIDS. And this is to say what Archie has raised early on, there's also a larger question in, in, in how can we, uh, can, can the SIDS in particular provide evidence that clearly separates climate interventions from the development aid interventions that, that are usually, usually found in the SIDS. And that, in, in, again, in particular respect to urgency, is very difficult for the stakeholders to clarify. And lastly, there's also this question of, of urgency in respect to climate vulnerability. And here we found it is almost an indignation to ask for climate vulnerability for each and every funding proposal from the vulnerable group uh, of the SIDS. Next slide, please. Um, OK. Let us now move on to, a, to another aspect and then to, to, to go beyond the, the portfolio and look at the operations. So the effectiveness, essentially the effectiveness of the interventions. And what we found here, the most pertinent uh, uh, normative value that we looked at here and that seems to be a barrier for the SIDS is high transaction costs. Next slide, please. So, First and foremost, we need to say, and we need to acknowledge that most of the GCF projects, and that's not only for the SIDS, but for the entire GCF portfolio, are still in a relatively early phase. We would call that a startup stage or a startup uh, phase for most of the projects under implementation. And that means that it is very difficult to bring forward a very uh, in-depth assessment of the effectiveness of GCF interventions. However, the evaluation team has, has thought about this very hard and has, has said, okay, as we cannot go in a further assessment of the effectiveness of current interventions, we can look at the question of how, those, uh, how are those interventions mapping towards the country needs. And for this, we, could, we, we refer to the NDCs that described by, by the different stakeholders in the SIDS. What we found is that first and foremost, the SIDS are not a perfect tool to uh, talk about country needs, but are somewhat uh, a, a very, a very uh, a usual, a usual uh, way forward to identify the needs. But when then looking at the GCF and the GCF operations, we found that there's currently no tool that would allow the GCF to perfectly match and map needs to the different interventions that we have. And here in particular, if you think about the GCF result areas that, that, are, uh, that are explained and informed through the uh, results management framework, as well as the in investment, uh, the potential investment uh, 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 impact potential elements, apologies, that are described through the investment framework. They're not perfect. But then when looking at the NDC needs and how they are responded to, we found that there's also a certain cluster and as I said, initially, we have most of the interventions in the adaptation space, so 60, about 60%. Uh, it is only clear that also for the most frequent NDA needs that are addressed by the GCF, adaptation would appear here again. And it's water management and water access that are very per prominent here, as well as en energy from, uh, mitigation. But again, as said, they are clustered. So other NDC needs that are described, through, uh, that are described by the stakeholders are not responded to. And that's in particular food, agriculture, livelihood, and transportation. Another point and the lessons learned that we've, uh, that we've got from the different stakeholder engagements, from the different engagements of the academic uh, sphere, as, as, well as, as well as the stakeholders here in the Secretariat, we found that, yes, transaction cost is one of the single most important barriers to, to effectiveness in the SIDS. And in a way we want to describe them today is, is there's, there's three aspects to this, three categories. Category one is the coordination cost. So stakeholders in the countries have said that it's very difficult to coordinate between different donors and different donor requirements. And that makes it very difficult for GCF projects to be very effective. And that's what we call the coordination cost. Secondly, from a GCF's perspective, one third of all projects in the SIDS are multi-country projects. What does that mean? It's, it's an array of mul uh, multiple countries 
that are leading one project. And that translates into very little finance coming to a single individual country, which then again uh, uh, faces a lot of uh, uh, higher transaction costs to be really effective within the country. And thirdly, also the reports that we've got from the accredited entities, so the annual progress reports, in those 60% of those are reporting to in some way to the challenges of uh, related to uh, uh, um, transaction costs. Another aspect that goes beyond transaction costs but is really closely knit to this is the question of uh, innovation. So as you know, in the GCF governing instrument, there's uh, prominent, uh, prominent features to innovative processes. But what we found is that there's currently no clarity and no definition provided to help stakeholders in the country to show these innovative processes. And lastly, we've also looked at the question of the use of indigenous knowledge, knowledge uh, that's traditional to the country. And what we found is, yes, in surveys the, done with the AEs, we found that over 60% say that indigenous knowledge is built into the projects. But when looking further at, at the engagement, we found that in particular engagement with vulnerable groups in the SIDS is very low. And that's concerning. Next slide, please. And now we come to the last chapter here. And again, this is talking about the private sector. And what we found here is one of the most relevant uh, normative values that are, that are a barrier here is the question of adaptation. So here, uh, let me say a few things. First and foremost, the question of what and who is the private sector is very pertinent to the SITS. So what we found is that the, the concept and the conceptualization of private sector is very inconsistent between what the secretariat would describe as private sector and what the, the country stakeholders would describe. So for instance, micro and small businesses that are very common in the SIDS are completely disregarded or to a large extent disregarded by, by the private sector uh, uh, concepts here at the, at the GCF. In addition to this, the, the conceptualization at the GCF is very narrow. It only looks at the private sector facility. When in fact, DMA projects, so projects from division and mitigation, uh, from the division of mitigation and adaptation, are also looking at engagement of private sector. As well as DCP, the division for country uh, programming, does also look at the, at the aspects of supporting uh, private sector through readiness support. And here we come to the next question. The type of readiness support that is currently given does only look at the private sector from a very early stage, from a very initial stage, and does not translate currently in the development of actual projects with the private sector and for the private sector in the SIDS. We call this a significant majority gap. In relation to co-finance, so leveraging finance, which is one of the, the, the key uh, objectives of the private sector uh, with regards to the GCF, we found there's very limited engagement from the private sector facility and also only some engagement from the Division of Mitigation and Adaptation, as said earlier. They also have engagement with the private sector. And this uh, is about 15 million US dollars here in the SIDS, um, which equates to about 1% and is, is therefore also very low. In terms of adaptation, we just wanted to, to, to depict this here. When we think about private sector adaptation projects, we currently only see five projects that have some sort of engagement with the private sector from the public side, so from the, the uh, from managed by the division for mitigation and adaptation, and only one project that, that relates to the private sector from the private sector facility, which we regard as very, very low. And lastly, what we've heard from stakeholders in the country is that uh, 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 RFP, so requests for proposals, are a great opportunity, but also a great miss currently because they're not looking at, at the SITs and not utilized in the SITs. Lastly, uh, we wanted to show you here in this flowchart of how much money is effectively going uh, to the SITs and how is it going to the SITs. So if you see this first, uh, this first red stream here, you're looking at money that's going directly to the SITs, so that's, that's not multi-country projects, directly going to the SITs is related to the DMA, so the public uh, uh, sector, uh, 
here at the GCF, the Division for Mitigation and Adaptation, and it's mostly going into single country projects. So that's the major part of finance that's currently going to the SIDS from the GCF. The PSF side is that smaller one that you, if you follow my cursor here, you see that it's the smaller one that's going through DC, uh, for PC, PSF, so private sector facility, in single country projects. However, there's also a part, and this is this gray part that you see in the bottom of this graph, that's mixed countries. So it's not only SIDS, but also other country uh, uh, finance that's going from PSF right into multi-country projects that are also containing SIDS. So in total, it's only about 7% of, of all resources approved for the SIDS that can be accounted for, for, for PSF, the private sector facility. And we think that's very low. In addition to this, it's mostly related to multi-country projects. And I've mentioned that earlier, that's a huge concern for us. Next slide, please. So we now concluded the findings. And now let me just introduce some of the main recommendations that we would like to bring forward with this report. So again, we follow the same structure. We follow the same structure as, uh, as uh, earlier mentioned with the normative values that we've got. So flexibility in policy is one finding. The recommendation here is to finalize the remainder of policies uh, uh, that are really important for the SIDS. And secondly, also build in enough flexibility in the implementation of those policies and provide additional guidance that help the stakeholders to reinforce those policies in the countries. Secondly, for the capacity of access, as uh, Archie has alluded to, we think there is a, a great potential for regional direct access entities. And what we're asking here and recommending here is to build a, a particular window for regional direct access entities in readiness. Secondly, we've also alluded to this problem of, con uh, of concept node development. And here we think we need special support for the national direct access entity to build good concept nodes that can then lead to funding proposals. Thirdly, we also found that there is an array of country, concept nodes that are coming directly from the country. And at the moment, it's very difficult to find the adequate AE, the adequate access that could bring this project to life. And here we, we recommend a matchmaking opportunity that would link the concept nodes from the stakeholders in the country to potential accredited entities. Thirdly, to the urgency in the portfolio, we want to re-emphasize the importance of SAP, of the simplified approval process that has been far underutilized in the SIDS. And for that reason, we want to recommend to implement and look at the recommendations that we've made recently in the uh, recently finalized IEU SAP review. Secondly, and that's most important, we also would like to highlight the fact that uh, data should not be made a barrier. So the GCF needs to find ways to, to uh, include data in a very effective manner. And we, were, we would, we would uh, like to introduce cross-referencing from national plans as one possible solution or extrapolation and learning from other countries and other contexts. Next slide, please. Lastly, I'd like to bring to you the remainder of the recommendations. And that is, apologies, we have a little glitch here. Uh, and that is to high transaction costs and operations. And here we recommend that the, the policy for programmatic approach needs to be addressed and needs to be finalized. And secondly, we need to have far more clarity on how to provide guidance and definition for innovation and innovative approaches for the country stakeholders in order to include them in funding proposal and concept notes. And lastly, on this question of uh, 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 private sector related adaptation. We recommend that the private sector uh, strategy is to be addressed by the secretariat and is really needed. And secondly, we also require further coordination for a, a real private sector approach across all divisions at the GCF. And lastly, once these uh, questions of access are addressed, we also find that in a staged process, we could look at an RFP that is especially designed for private sector adaptation projects 
with a targeted allocation that is to be determined by the board. And very last, we also find that the, 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 the access to direct access entities, so to national direct access entities, needs to be addressed. There's currently a lack of private sector related entities in this respect. Thank you very much.